Only a kid One of the prizes Southpaw, what up? I'm taking over this year, man The following program, Normal Show Live Is intended for responsible adults only We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, And I think we need to rethink and decriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, tokers and tokettes, and welcome. It is Thursday, February 16th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. I still don't know why that video ends its music so quickly, but we'll get that figured out. Kind of disconcerting every time I, every time that happens. <laughs> Whoa, but, we got to do a show. <laughs> wait a minute, what the hell? Uh, welcome back. It is uh, Thursday, February 16th, like I said earlier, and uh, we got a great show for you today. Uh, let's start by introducing the folks in the studio. We move to my right here. We've got our pirate, Ganja John, who is back in the studio. How you doing, John? What's up, Russ? How you doing? Have you recovered fully from L.A.? I think, yeah, I have. <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel really bad about not showing up yesterday. I just lost track of time making hash oil. How could that possibly happen? How could happen? that possibly happen? Because it's so fun and so good for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And we, I ended up making like two ounces. Good so, Lord. you know, it was, it was a long day, and I'm sorry, but uh, Normal Show Live will reap the benefits, I promise, over the next couple months. <laughs> That's right. It's going to be a good thing for everyone involved, I'm sure of that. Uh, so, Ganja John's got the Daily Toker tune for today. Uh, what do we got in the hip hop? Today, bin? we have Flatbush Zombies with Thug Waffle. You know, that's perfect because that uh, Walking Dead just started its uh, second half of its season. I yes. watched the episode the other day. So I'm all about the zombie today. That's These are news. zombies from Brooklyn. Brooklyn zombies. Flatbush zombies even. Yep. Oh, we better watch out. Also joining us from our virtual studio in beautiful Grastoria, Oregon, is our senior news editor, Cannabis Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hello, guys. And uh, Carrie brings us the hemp headlines right after the first break. So what do we got in the news today? Uh, well, we've got some news about SB 6265 up in Washington. Not great news, I'll give you that. Uh, also, I've got some celebrity news. We're going to start with a video by Tony Bennett calling for legalization. We're going to go to Delaware, where their medical marijuana program is uh, in jeopardy. And also, I've got some a suggestion for pilots. All right. That's coming up in our news <laughs> right after this first break. Also, I've got some news from Chicago, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, and their, uh, he's kind of stalling their decrim uh, idea down there. We'll talk more about that. On the show today, we've also got Terry Joyce with the Hollywood Hemptress. Uh, she's bringing George Clayton Johnson to the show. He's the author of a t- The First Twilight Zone, Logan's Run, and Ocean's Eleven. Should be an interesting discussion. Followed up with Cassandra Frederic, who's going to talk about a 21 Jump Street style sting to bust kids with weed. We're back after this. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. 
WeedMaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit WeedMaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. That's the Dirt Ball from Suburban Noise Records, Cottonmouth Kings. This is Normal Show Live. Keep it right here, yeah. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or a flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from Stealth-Products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Elliot Beats. Stealth-Products.com. Stealth-Products.com. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. I can't let Tony Bennett's response to the death of Whitney Houston go without note. The death of Whitney Houston was the talking point for musicians last weekend as many in the industry came together for the 54th annual Grammy Awards. The toxology reports are not in yet, but it is suspected that she died of prescription drug and alcohol interaction. At Clive Davis's pre-Grammy party on Saturday night, one that Whitney was getting ready to attend when she died, Bennett took his turn on the stage and used the time to say more than just a memory of Whitney Houston. Bennett used the opportunity to talk about other recent celebrity deaths uh, by legal drugs. He said that Michael Jackson and Amy Winehouse, and now Whitney Houston, should make the U.S. government reevaluate its position on drugs. Tony Bennett asked every celebrity in the room to campaign to legalize drugs and said that ultimately legalizing all drugs would save lives. Now, just on a side note, Bennett, along with the late Amy Winehouse, did go on the next night to win a Grammy together uh, for their duet, Body and Soul. So we have a video of him speaking at that Clive Davis party on Saturday night, uh, the night before the Grammys. House. And now the magnificent Whitney Houston. I'd like to have every gentleman and lady in this room commit themselves to get our government to legalize drugs. So they'll have to get it through a doctor, not to some gangsters that just sell it under the table. Now, of course, there are a lot of people that are commenting on this video and speaking about how Tony Bennett, there's a major fail here because Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, and the others he named died from prescription drugs, that is, legal drugs. And they're saying, well, what would legalizing drugs do to have helped Whitney when what she died of is allegedly or most likely uh, prescription drugs? But I think Tony Bennett is right on on this because the illegality of some drugs creates this situation where addicts are stigmatized, regardless of what they're addicted to, whether it's legal drugs or illegal drugs. And in a situation like Whitney Houston, where she was, uh, you know, using, she admitted to using crack cocaine, uh, you have a situation where somebody might be ashamed or stigmatized about doing that, or if she's not someone like Whitney Houston, gets arrested and imprisoned for using those kind of drugs. And so a lot of times those people, when they get in trouble, and if they have means like Whitney Houston does, when they get in trouble with something like cocaine, uh, they, they're, you know, shuffled off to some, you know, rehab to try to make the PR better, but they don't ever really get any treatment. They've all got all these yes people around them, yes men, yes women, who'll do anything they want, which is the worst thing in the world you could have for an addict. And they merely just shift the drug addiction from the illegal street drugs that look bad to the drugs that the doctor prescribes that looks good. And as we found in the Conrad Murray trial with Michael Jackson, and, and we may find with Whitney Houston, a lot of these doctors are also the yes men and the yes women that will do anything to keep the celebrity happy. Legalize all drugs, end this stigma on drug addicts, and we can save a few more talented people. And we've got some breaking news from Washington State. Senate Bill 6265, the bill that would have regulated medical marijuana dispensaries in the state and provide a companion element to the controversial I-502 bill, 
is officially dead. I-502 of pass will regulate marijuana for all adults in the state, but it does have a DUID provision that would make a blood THC limit of five nanograms, making someone legally impaired to operate a vehicle. Some marijuana activists have decried the legalization effort over the inclusion of that DUID provision. They feel it would unfairly target medical marijuana patients whose tolerance may be higher and would most likely always be over that limit. Senate Bill 6265 addressed that issue by saying that card-carrying medical marijuana patients would have protection from that provision should I-502 pass by requiring more evidence than the blood THC limit evidence. The medical marijuana regulation bill uh, never got a Senate floor vote, essentially killing it in the Senate. Last year, Governor Gregoire vetoed much of another medical marijuana regulation bill. Uh, it's a shame, and it would have been nice to get some protection for patients here, but I think overall we've got to look at the bigger picture. For those activists who are saying this would unfairly target the driving of, of patients with a higher tolerance, you're absolutely right. But marijuana prohibition unfairly targets all of us. Marijuana prohibition unfairly targets healthy and sick alike. And for, you know, what is it, 13 years now in Washington State, they've had protections for the sick. They've had protections from arrest for the people that are growing for their medical purposes. It's time to start thinking about all of us. It is no less a tragedy when someone loses their freedom, loses their uh, their their uh, right to drive, loses any of these things because of marijuana prohibition. It doesn't matter whether they're healthy or sick. It's still the same kind of tragedy. So don't uh, don't lose sight of the prize that we have to get legalization in some state somewhere at some time. Somebody needs to be the first domino to fall. And I know for myself, I couldn't put myself on the same side of the ballot as the DEA and the prohibitionists that don't want to see Washington pass this I-502. Delaware's implementation of a medical marijuana program was put off uh, put further in jeopardy last week when Governor Jack Markell suspended the regulation and licensing process for medical marijuana dispensaries, effectively killing the program. The Delaware model requires that marijuana would have to be grown in secured facilities. And in addition, security was mandated for compassion centers that would have made patients or their caregivers feel safe, the same as patients feel when obtaining other medical therapies. Markell also criticized the fe federal government for sending mixed signals to law enforcement. The government's office or the governor's office blamed its decision to stop implementing the law on a recent change in attitude towards state marijuana laws by President Barack Obama's Department of Justice. He was getting pressured from U.S. Attorney Charles M. Oberly III, who wrote a letter to Governor Markell's attorney last Thursday saying that, quote, growing, distributing, and possessing marijuana in any capacity other than as part of a federally authorized research program is a violation of federal law regardless of state laws permitting such activities. Moreover, those who are engaging in financial transactions involving the proceeds of such activities may also be in violation of federal money laundering statutes. Oberly also wrote in that letter that state employees who conduct activities mandated by the Delaware Medical Marijuana Act are not immune from the liability under the Controlled Substances Act. Now, in the wake of that letter, Markell's office last Friday told the Department of Health and Social Services that issuing licenses to medical marijuana dispensaries could put state employees and landowners at risk for federal raids or prosecution. The office had recently sought legal guidance from Oberly on uh, if state employees would need to fear prosecution. Now, the original sponsor of that medical marijuana bill, Senator Margaret Rose Henry, has come out this week urging the governor to allow the regulatory process to continue while this discussion continues in search of a solution that has now become a national issue. So another standstill in implementing of a past medical marijuana law, Russ. Yeah, more, <laughs> more of the same. Yeah. Yeah, another governor chickening out uh, over the will of their people or the will of their legislature, in the case of Delaware, instituting a medical marijuana law. But one scary letter from a U.S. attorney has these governors running. Come on now, stand up for your people, stand up for this and fight this, fight the federal government on this issue. Do you really think the feds are going to dare to prosecute some state worker uh, in a state that has legalized mar medical marijuana who has come up with regulations for their state workers? Do you really think the federal government is going to dare to prosecute a state worker who's uh, working in accordance with the law. I would like to see that fight happen. I would like to see the feds just try to do something like that. That would really bring this medical marijuana issue into the, the forefront of, the, of people's minds. And in an election year, I can't believe that the Obama administration
administration would want that kind of fight, that kind of public relations, uh, a state versus federal fight, when the Republicans will be glad to swoop up and, and outflank him on that state's rights issue. I think this is the time to call the president's bluff, to call the administration's bluff, and these governors shouldn't be hiding behind some sort of plea for rescheduling into Schedule 2. They should go forward with their programs as written and dare the federal government to do something about it. And today at 11.30 a.m. in Southern California, we have reports of two F-16 fighters pulling up alongside a Cessna 182 oh, and asking them to land. As it turns out, the little plane had flown into restricted airspace because Obama's Air Force One was heading with the president to San Francisco for a fundraiser after staying a night in Beverly Hills. We now know that the pilot of that little plane must have been thinking he was paranoid because after he was forced to land at the Long Beach airport, the plane was met with local law enforcement for routine questioning. Officials have confirmed that they found Mary marijuana on that Cessna and the pilot is in custody. So just like when you were driving with marijuana on board, we urge you to follow uh, every rule. Same goes if you're flying a plane. Well, this, poor guy. He's got a bag of bag of weed. Did they say how much he had on the plane? They didn't. I really looked for that. They didn't say, <laughs> but they did put him in custody. So, uh, you know, it might have right. been considerable. We don't know. All right. So this guy's got some amount of weed on the plane. Imagine you're the guy flying with weed on the plane. And two F-16s pull up next to you. It's like, geez, man, I must have the best weed on the freaking planet. I, I would be very scared. <laughs> I think you know, that's the one place you feel like you're safe from cops is in the air. <laughs> no, right. Especially in a plane. And then an F-16 pulls up. Those are the big kind of cops. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they put the red and blues on when they <laughs> pull up next to you. That would be something to see. Well, we'll keep you posted on what happens with this story. And I also have a story, uh, some more celebrity news. Sir Paul McCartney, one of my favorite Beatles, is is arguably the most prolific musical career in modern times. And McCartney, who began his career in the legendary band The Beatles, has now told media that he has finally given up his last recreational drug of choice, marijuana. Rolling Stone magazine featured an interview with Paul out this month where he says the main reason, I don't believe it either, (laughs) but the main reason he is finally giving up on cannabis is because of his eight-year-old daughter Beatrice. McCartney is now 69 years old. He's still writing and playing music and he performed at the Grammys last week. He has famously said that it was Bob Dylan who introduced him to marijuana and during the height of Beatles mania in the 60s worldwide, the group experimented with heroin, LSD and cocaine and other psychedelics and their openness to talk about their experiences with drugs to the media spoke to to a generation of young adults through that decade. Decade During his long career, Paul has been arrested uh, more than once uh, for marijuana possession. Uh, he was uh, arrested in Japan where he got de- uh, deported, and he was also arrested in Barbados. And there was one other I couldn't remember, but he's been arrested a few times. Yeah, and Paul. of course, that uh, Japan arrest is what was the inspiration for the song Band on the Run. And Jailer Man and Sailor Sam and all of that, it's all Band on the Run. I don't believe it. I don't believe Paul McCartney's given up weed, or if he has, it's a it's a temporary thing. We, we heard the same, I, uh, we heard the I same thing. I think it's a custody thing thing actually well, that could be it because we heard Maybe. the same thing when he was dealing with heather mills remember when he first got married to her and she was very anti-pot and he said oh i'm giving it up i'm not gonna do it again and sure he he's doing it again so uh well we'll, we'll see I, I don't know i i can't imagine sir paul uh, going into his old age without a nice reefer by his side all right one more story here to uh end up the news something i found uh in the chicago reader uh, Chicago is going nowhere on their pot ticket reform while spending millions. Now, you might remember uh, on November, we reported on Ward Alderman Danny Solis, uh, who was going to uh, propose a city ordinance that would let police issue tickets for possession of 10 grams of pot or less. And, you know, a little less than half an ounce, maybe a little more than a quarter. Uh, officers would still have the option of making full arrests, but Solis said the law could help narrow the grass gap. And what they call the grass gap is the fact that while marijuana is used widely in neighborhoods all across Chicago, African-Americans account for 78 percent of those arrested, 89 percent of those convicted and 92 percent of those jailed for low level marijuana possession in Chicago. Now, 26 other aldermen had signed on as co-sponsors and Soli said that he'd hoped the council would hold hearings on the proposal as soon as November or December. Well, of course, it is now February. From November 2nd to January 29th, Chicago police made at least 4,480 arrests for misdemeanor marijuana possession. It was by far the largest category of arrests during that time. Each arrest took two officers off the street for at least a half an hour, or I'm sorry, at least an hour and a half, and led to $2,500 or more in court costs. This leads to an annual tab of at least $78 million for low-level pot busts, though nine out of every 10 cases are thrown out of court. 
Well, apparently no price is too high to keep roughing up and arresting young black men in Chicago over pot. Realize that's 13,440 police man hours in addition to the $78 million tab to take one out of 10 arrests to court. Or here's another way to look at it. Each marijuana arrest in Chicago over that period, November 2nd to January 29th, three month period, costs $17,410. It's probably cheaper for the city to just buy all the marijuana in Chicago than to try to catch the people who are buying and selling it. But no luck on getting Rahm Emanuel, the the, uh, mayor of Chicago, to make any changes on this. Remember, when he was in the Clinton administration, he proposed stopping the medical marijuana train that had just started in California by arresting doctors who would dare to talk about it. Also, we've got a a big uh, gathering coming up, uh, conventions and and, uh, WTO, I believe, coming to Chicago. And Rahm Emanuel's very concerned with making sure the protests don't gonna get out of hand. The last thing he wants to do is reduce the, the tickets, uh, or reduce to a ticket uh, marijuana possession that he could be using to rough up people and keep their peace in Chicago. What oh. do you think about a break, Russ? I think it's a little bit late, but we'll get to it. <laughs> it <laughs> let's see, what, see if we can uh, enjoy some of the fine stuff, and we'll be right back after this. It's 20 after the hour. We have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. I smell vermin tank. And the only good vermin tang is dead vermin tang. I think. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Friends, it's time we legalize the responsible use of marijuana and stop treating marijuana smokers like criminals. We're destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of good, hardworking Americans every year in this country for no good reason. There's absolutely nothing wrong with smoking pot. For more information on how you can help legalize marijuana, please contact Normal at norml.org. It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420 friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Groovin' Thursday, our salute to all the dopest beats and killer rhymes that we find in the best of rap, hip hop, soul, R&B, and funk. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tune. That, that break was way too short. We're going to have to make up for it during this song. But the good news is we got video for this song. Turn things over to Ganja John with our Groovin' Thursday. Uh, here today we have the Flatbush Zombies out of Brooklyn from Flatbush Avenue, obviously. And uh, when it's a it's a trio of musicians, uh, two MCs and one DJ. As and, it should be, as old it school. Be. Old school style. <laughs> And uh, when asked about their name, the MC said, uh, we're zombies and we're from Flatbush. <laughs> well, that explains everything. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, the, this is uh, really an eclectic kind of style of music. They don't have a lot of information out on these guys. You can follow them out on Twitter at Meech is Dead and uh, Cool as Ice, I believe. You got those in the chat room? We'll put those up. Yeah, I'll put them up in the chat room. But anyways, uh, without further ado, here's the weirdest video I've seen all week. Flatbush Zombies with Thug Waffle. Yeah, uh, yeah, 
Uh. Today I purchased a coffin and I ain't even died yet. Smoked about a hundred blunts and I ain't even high yet. Wrote my verse some poisoning, watch you bite or die yet. Got the illest brain yet, no I can deny this. Lungs full of uh, eyes bloody red, nigga gold veins on. Uh, pocket full of dead, nigga smoke some bitch. What the fuck you waiting on? I know it's a virtue, but baby my patience and go. Yeah, I really chain on. Take her to a vacant home. What you want a quickie sticky? Okay, I won't take it long. Flip the dust down the middle like Moses. Did the seed count it up? Bag it up. We love money, we love weed. Met this one being bow. Told her my name was Leaf, but she keep calling me Mandingo. My eyes bloody red, so she probably think I'm evil. Truly, it's the weed smoke from all this type of diesel. Light it, then I breeze up. See you weed flow, must be from that weed smoke. I Chinese, so we smoke as how I be so. Blood sign is to what it is, you be me, yo. Fuck the police, so we smoke it like illegal. See you weed flow, must be from that weed smoke. I Chinese, so we smoke as how I be so. Blood sign is to what it is, you be me, yo. Fuck the police, so we smoke it like illegal. Hoes love me, shit around. Hoes love me, shit around. Sit back, get smack, get stoned. In the back of the back of the room, with the back in the back of the room, she act it doom. Blast back in the room, with men they all foe. I mean they all foes. Call this my dumb flow. Ergo, rolled out. Call this my perk flow. Roll up the endo. I'm here, dog. What you here for? Hip hop is dead. Zombies for press. Remind the untimely. Two blunts, I'm Siamese. Pussy, we grindy. Sticky and grimy. Wicked, unchind me. Twisted, my frame be. Blunt after blunt after blunt. So stuck, so stuck off the what? Sticky, icky, quickly. Vicky, lick me. No hickeys. Gin and whiskey. Just me and some kitties. Swiftly. See we flow, must be from that we smoke. I Chinese, so we smoke as how I be so. Blood sign is to what it is, you be me, yo. Fuck the police, so we smoke it like illegal. See we flow, must be from that we smoke. I Chinese, so we smoke as how I be so. Blood sign is to what it is, you be me, yo. Fuck the police, so we smoke it like illegal. It's Wiz Coleco from the Ivy Island Hour, which comes to you live every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific on the Normal Network. I just wanted to let you know that two of my favorite bands are teaming up to spread good vibes across the land and are headed to a venue near you. Revolution is heading out on the second leg of their tour in support of the release of their new triple album, Peace of Mind, which includes full-length acoustic and dub versions. They'll also be joined by our boys from the land of Aloha, The Green. We're also promoting the recent release of their latest album, Raisin Means. You can check out a full list of shows, get the latest swag, and most importantly, find their music at revolutionmusic.com and thegreen808.com. Don't miss this amazing tour. I promise you, after these shows, you'll have peace of mind. This is a perfect platform to show people the, the, the support that this movement actually has. You know, this is, this is a, a new event for us, and look at how many people showed up and, and, and to, kick, to come see this panel and to hear what the hell is being said about legalization and medical now. Strength and numbers, strength and numbers. Yeah, you know, strength and numbers, and, and that's what this is, is to, to join all these, these like-minded people that believe in this cause, and uh, who better to have up here, you know, doing it, man? Tommy Chong, Dr. <laughs> Uh, he served time as an example. I was, a, I was thinking too, you know, they got uh, the Republican or the far right has the tea baggers. Yeah. So we should create our own, or how about weed baggers? Weed baggers. We belong to the weed bagger party. The weed bagger party. And we believe and we believe in giving uh, love and a bag of weed to all our neighbors. 
has to be a, 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 a part of our trip when we're when we do get it legal. Let's have a one day where everybody just gives weed to someone that needs it. We'll, we'll, we'll give a we'll give a new meaning to the word sacrilegious. <laughs> Tune in to the Normal Network every weekday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern for our primetime lineup. We begin with an hour of daily Toker tunes, followed by Normal Show Live and Toker Talk Radio, live from Rolla J Studios in Portland, Oregon. Then, you get two hours of recorded podcasts from national and international reformers, followed by our late-night live shows at 11 p.m. Eastern. Then the whole six-hour block repeats twice overnight. It's the Normal Network, your source for the best in marijuana media. <laughs> Weed. That's Hoobie Valley, Hoobie Hub. Weed. Where any office boy or It's time for a return to the epicenter of American cannabis culture. With our guest, you know her from season one of NBC's Last Comic Standing. It's the Hollywood Hemptress herself, Terry Joyce. All right, it seems like we were just hanging out together last week. How you doing, Terry? hanging out and i had the best time with you guys oh i know it's so good to have you on the show live and uh, uh i understand though the rest of the weekend you had some uh, other things to attend to and we should make mention of of the uh, freedom fighter that we lost and and maybe you can tell yes. us about the uh, services yes uh actually uh, one of our freedom fighters here in los angeles he was a, a gay activist uh and a medical marijuana activist uh and um kind of like a Sort of an icon, I guess, in, in West Hollywood. Uh, his name is Richard Kern. Mm -hmm. He was a poet, uh, a journalist, and a science fiction writer. And uh, what was so special also about him was that, you know, when you go to court and, and you, you know, speak your mind about the laws that, you know, they're trying to implement or when they're trying to ban uh, our dispensaries or go against what we voted for, he would not only just, you know, fill out a speaker card and speak, but he spoke, he spoke in prose. I mean, he, he wrote pieces and uh, addressed them and had them t timed down to the two minutes that he was allowed to speak for. Um, but he just uh, recently passed away. We did a wonderful memorial, um, Jay Couty with the Patient Advocacy Network. Uh, he was uh, on the board of directors and uh, helped her found that organization. And uh, she uh, pretty much spearheaded the memorial in West Hollywood uh, at Kings Road Park. And Patrick Duff uh, also was a, a former dispensary owner of Liberty Bell. Um, he also has been on the show a couple of times. And uh, he was the guy who actually was in the raid with me with the right. DEA. He was the one who was hogtied. Mm -hmm. um, that's Patrick. Anyway, he also uh, did the, he's Reverend Patrick Duff, uh, gave the prayer and the eulogy, and it was absolutely beautiful. So, yeah, I, I was actually kind of caught up with that on Saturday, and I missed out on all the fun. <laughs> well, not to say that that wasn't fun, but, right. you know. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for letting us know about that, and uh, our condolences go out to the friends and family of Richard Kearns, and just another great fighter for our rights uh, in more ways than one, not just cannabis rights. Uh, now, Terry, the other thing we ought to get out of the way before we get to your guest, I want to take too much time because I love the guest today, but oh, uh, yeah. got the Hollywood Hemptress Hour coming up tonight. What can we look forward to at uh, 7 o'clock Pacific? Yes, well, it, you know, uh, yesterday we taped our first year anniversary show, so uh, I celebrated my first year. And uh, so this, that's mainly what that particular show is about. I want to let the listeners know to check out our new website at HollywoodHemptressHemporium.com. Okay. But I'm going to move on uh, because our guest, uh, I'm very excited to have him uh, here today. Uh, and speaking of science fiction writers, this one, this one is, uh, takes the cake. He actually wrote the very first episode of tw The Twilight Zone oh, wow. and uh, co-wrote. Uh, the book Logan's Run with William F. Nolan, mm -hmm. and uh, also um, you know wrote the original Ocean's Eleven. Uh, so I, wow. I and and he also has been a, a, a hemp activist, marijuana activist, and a long, long time friend of Jack Hare. Uh, I'd like to welcome George Clayton Johnson to the Normal Show Live. Hi, George. How are you? I'm excellent, and I thank you very much for 
inviting me on your program. You know, I, I when I heard your name and when Terry sent me the email and I, and I saw your name, I recognized the name because as a kid, I was big into sci-fi and the movie version of your book, Logan's Run, was one of the first uh, uh, sci-fi movies I remember. Uh, for those that don't know it, it's a, a tale of a, a futuristic world where people are programmed or, or, or have to die by the age of 30. And it's a, so it's a concept that's been taken in other uh, directions by other sci-fi movies, but yours was the first. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for being on our show. Well, you know, you ask yourself, what power does government have? Mm -hmm. And then what power would government like to have? Government can send you, can draft you and send you off to a war to die. Can it also decide when your life is over in the name of uh, of uh, population control? Yeah, yeah, you know. It's... You know it's, so that's a really a frightening thing, and I understand they're remaking that movie. They're going to do another one right, based right. upon the book. Yeah, and there was also uh, a Justin Timberlake movie out recently where the concept was, you know, there was a limited amount of time that counted down uh, in your life. Uh, so it's a the concept that's been used before. But, but George, I want to get to the, the marijuana activism side of this. Um, ha has marijuana always been something that's been near and dear to you? Did you just come upon it when you met Jack Herrer, or how far back does this go for you? <laughs> I think the first time I had some really serious discussions about it was with uh, Captain Ed Adair. Uh -huh. He had a head shop in uh, in California in, in Van Nuys called Heads and Highs. Mm -hmm. The authorities objected to the word I, so he had to change it to the H and H shopping. <laughs> but I would go to his head shop to buy screens and stuff and talk to him about uh, what was very hot on the minds of all of us at the time, which was that we had come to realize that you take a simple substance like paper. You know, paper's been made with trees. But then you find out you don't have to cut down another tree to make all the paper you want. Yeah. And not only that, but the paper you would make out of hemp would be stronger, more durable, more long-lasting, and in every way uh, superior to what you could buy in the market today. Mm -hmm. And that in time past, hemp was used for those purposes. I've got books that, have, that are made out of hemp paper that go back to 17, 1800, mm -hmm. and they are durable and they're sturdy and they're just beautiful documents. So I look around at things like food and fiber and fuel and medicine and plastics and paints and cellophane and dynamite and just about anything you can think of. Literally, you can make it out of hemp. And for me and for Ed, what really interests us at the time was, it's a jobs issue. Mm -hmm. That hemp is more than a drug. It is so many other things that it's a new source for all most of the products we make from petroleum and from trees and from other natural resources. But here's an ever renewable resource to make fuel for for uh, cars and also to generate energy in our electrical plants, and that it's got a fiber that is competitive in every way and often superior to cotton mm -hmm. and doesn't cause the pollution of all the streams and rivers in America with chemicals the way that cotton does. And, I mean, we were marveling at it. We were thinking, this hemp could save the world. Yeah. I mean, that is to say that if there was no more petroleum, we could still run our cars and and put out electrical grids and grow paper and, and get ourselves all the fabrics we would need. And uh, along the way, the only drawback to this wonderful plant called hemp is that it's a mild euphoriant and it gets you high. And that is so counted against it. Everybody has attacked it because, my God, you know, the kids, what about the children? Yeah. Well, my response, of course, is, they're the people who need it the most. <laughs> I mean, we want to expand awareness and consciousness in children. And we have uh, schools that are deliberately dumbing us down. For yeah. what purpose? I don't know what our masters want from us. They used to raise us to be laborers in their factories, but now they don't have any factories. <laughs> so what are they going to do with us? And I used to see that every television show that I watch these days, like... like uh, uh, criminal minds, every damn show in it 
has an autopsy in it. And my big question mark is, what are they preparing us for? <laughs> what, what, what role yeah. is that Joe, Joe Sixpack going to play in the future? That's a good and point. And if they have their way, no role at all. And that's why I say, hey, let's shake up the power structure. Let's, let's build up. Well, for example, here in California, in November, we're going to be voting on something that's called the, the California Cannabis Hemp and Health Initiative in 2012. And we know we need to get up a million bucks somehow to get all the signatures to get it onto the ballot in November. But it's a complete legalization thing that says, let us industrialize hemp. Let's make a jobs issue out of it. And when we think of all the money that people are afraid to bring out of their savings accounts because they've just watched themselves get raped and they know that nobody is to be trusted and that everything you hear is a lie, and now... Along comes this thing called hemp. Yeah. And my God, this is a place to place your money. Yeah, hemp you can definitely save the money. world. George Clayton Johnson, uh, author of the first Twilight Zone episode, Logan's Run, and so much more. I, I did want to get into the marijuana side of things and find out, you know, you mentioned it being a mild euphorant, but I find it for myself uh, very helpful uh, creatively when I'm trying to write. Is it something that ever sparked your creativity in writing? Oh, always, always. I, I smoke some marijuana every day for over 40 years years, maybe 50. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. 50 years, almost daily, three, four times a week. Oftentimes, it'll be the first thing I do in the morning, and it electrifies my brain. It wakes me right the hell up. I'm 82 years old. I'm still as bright as I ever was. You sure are. You know, I can still put my one foot in front of the other, <laughs> and I blame a lot of it upon hemp. But, uh, in fact, hemp as a medical thing you would think would probably be the worst thing there is for emphysema or for, for uh, asthma, but it actually uh, forces you to cough a lot of that crap up that mm -hmm. they're now using chemicals to try to, to dilute so yeah. that you can, you can get rid of this congestion. They call it congestive disease, you know, yeah. COPD. Yeah. But yeah, it serves almost every purpose. I can hardly think of a area of my life that I can't point to him and say, yeah, that, I'm very deeply involved in that. Right on. But also, uh, you do ask this question. See, the one thing that him is in, why it is such an enemy of the state is because it allows you to think. It gets your mind cooking. Somehow, it's very productive of a higher state of consciousness. People want to alter their consciousness. And marijuana, cannabis, is just marvelous at being able to lift you out of the humdrum and excite you. And when I look around at a world that seems to lack curiosity, certainly in the news people, they'll give you a little fragment of a story, and you say, why, where, when, what? And they have no answer to any of that. You know, a man died on Fifth Street today. Another news item is, you know, and they tell you the next news item. Yeah. And you listen to this, and you think, good God, these people are brain dead. <laughs> These people on the TV are brain dead. Yeah. Why is it that I cannot hear an intelligent conversation? <laughs> Why is it when two news people start chattering together, it immediately dissolves into uh, silliness? Yeah. There's I... just and and why? And I think it is because they've allowed themselves to be too sober. They need to awaken themselves to the glory of life. I know myself. I'm I'm as excited at the idea of existence. I see it as a total miracle. I don't understand things like, uh, like how can you put two odorless, colorless gases together and they get wet? You know? How, <laughs> yeah. How, how does that what happen? It I, miraculously out of nowhere comes stuff. Hey, George, I, I, want to give, I want to give Terry a chance to get a question in as well because uh, we have a limited amount of time here on the segment. So, uh, Terry, you have sure. a question for George Clayton Johnson? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I just, I, first of all, I just want to, again, say thank you to George for coming on. And I, I so much, I, I just love listening to him speak. Um, so, but George, I, I understand that you have a, a new website that's going up soon. Uh, yes. And can you tell it's, it's, about that? It's called a touch of com. <laughs> Look it up. A touch of com. I'm preparing to do remakes of some of my Twilight Zone episodes. Oh. Huh. For example, you take a show like Kick the Can, and I know 20 or 30 Twilight Zone stars 
who played in episodes of The Twilight Zone. I've gone to the different reunions, and I've met a lot of these people. And I'm trying thinking, I could shoot, kick the can, and put a whole bunch of very familiar Twilight Zone faces in it. And so I'm now trying to organize and get together the cash, the people, the impetus, the, all that it'll take to make a, uh, a program. Yeah. And I'm calling this uh, website uh, Touch of Strange because I want to keep everybody kind of informed on the progress of it because it's my contention that what the, what the world needs is another Twilight Zone series. <laughs> I agree, and please, everyone, check out atouchofstrange.com and George Clayton Johnson joining us on the phone here. This is a fantastic time with you. I wish we had more time. Would you, would you join us again sometime in the future? We could get more into depth on the science fiction uh, yes, side of I'd things? Yes, I'd be happy. I would be happy to. That's so wonderful. Terry, Terry, it's fun talking to you again. I, I really enjoy your company. Oh, Oh, my, my my heart just swelled three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry, thank you for bringing George to the show, and uh, we'll look forward to listening to Hollywood Hemptress Hour tonight at 7 o'clock Pacific. I, thank you. All right. Also, big thanks to the folks at New Dissonant Radio who are uh, providing the uh, forum for the Hollywood Hemptress Hour. You can check them out at NewDissonantRadio.com. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, Cassandra Frederic from the Drug Policy Alliance on a 21 Jump Street flirt catch people with weed thing <laughs> Back you're listening to normal show live the voice of the marijuana nation you know why we pirates love the normal show because <laughs> it's always smoking matey <laughs> ever wonder how often to change your bong water the most effective method for baking pot brownies the best destinations for a ganja getaway how to hide herb in your car, whether to grow your own, how precisely to legalize it, or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place. Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook wove all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history, profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. No one expects a Spanish Inquisition! You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Right about plant. All right, everybody, we've got a story to tell you here that uh, I got from Tony Newman at the Drug Policy Alliance, and uh, we're just getting Cassandra Frederic on the phone from Drug Policy Alliance. Tony had to make a flight today and couldn't join us on the show, but uh, I'll give her a chance to talk more about it. But basically, we're talking about an undercover sting uh, involving uh, police officers posing as high school kids. Uh, if you remember the show 21 Jump Street uh, on Fox that launched Johnny Depp's career, uh, that might sound a little bit familiar to you. They've also got a remake of that coming up, don't they? Yeah, with Jonah Hill and, uh, God, I forget the other, it, half of Jonah Hill, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened to Jonah Hill? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that new movie is coming out, so it, it kind of brings up that subject of the old uh, undercover cops in the uh, high school story. So we're going to go to the uh, phone line right here and go to, uh, what well, Carrie's here on the line just a second. Let me bring Carrie up. Uh, do we have a connection, Carrie? We do. She's on the line and ready to go. All right, Cassandra, thanks for joining us on short notice. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Okay, I kind of did a little bit of a setup on this show, uh, on this story of, uh, about it being a, a sting at a high school with undercover cops. Uh, give us the, the full details on this. Um, so basically what happened was there was a young man in Florida uh, who was in high school and he fell in love with a young woman and who was presumably another high school student. Um, and they had been talking and flirting and texting back and forth for several weeks. Um, and one day the woman asked him for um, 
some marijuana, asked him if he smoked. Um, the person, the, the young boy told her that he didn't smoke, um, but that he could get her marijuana. Um, after a while, she kept asking him, prompting him to get her some marijuana. Um, and the young boy finally one day, you know, texted her back and was like, okay, I got it for you. Um, this is also, remember, this is a young man that doesn't smoke. Um, and he brought the young woman, um, some marijuana and she asked, she, she tried to give him money for it and he didn't want to give it to her. He's like, no, you know, this is a young boy that's like totally trying to impress this young woman. Um, and no, I don't want it. I don't want to give, this is a present. I don't want to, um, take money for it. This is for you. Reluctantly, she kept pushing and insisting and he finally took the money. Um, and a few days later, there was a sting operation in the high school, and they arrested 31 young high school students, including this young man, um, his name was Justin, because it turns out that the woman that he had been courting and thought that had a great relationship with and was a good friend and possibly someone he could be romantically involved with was a 25-year-old um, undercover police officer. Oh, no. So <laughs> it was definitely a case of manipulation of a young, you know, boy's feelings. Yeah. It was entrapment. And it was a total erosion of trust between, you know, what this young man thought was his friend. Um, so that's, and this is probably happening all over the country. Um, these elaborate sting operations that are, you know, focusing on young people and manipulating young people's feelings. Um, there are examples of, um, young teenagers who make friends with undercover police officers unbeknownst to them, um, and exchange, um, you know, give them marijuana and the police officer pushes to give them money for it. And then they get caught up. Have, have there been reports at this school or any indications that there was some sort of major problem with uh, marijuana dealing or anything like that going on to necessitate this kind of sting? Um, I don't. So I don't know the complete details of that case, but I know that this is something that has happened before. My colleague, um, Tony Newman of the Drug Policy Alliance, wrote a story about another similar story of a young man who, you know, made friends with an undercover police officer and uh, exchanged money for it. But it was definitely, he, did, he also didn't want to take money for it. And actually, for two years, it had, you know, two years and got a felony over his head because of situations like this. And most of the times, these are situations where um, large, they put, they create this elaborate um, sting operation in different high schools around the country, looking for drugs, um, trying to protect people, and um, the young people usually get caught up because of the manipulation and their the ta- their most famous tactic is entrapment of these young people. Yeah, it, it just it seems to be you know what are they actually trying to accomplish? I mean, how much how much uh, marijuana do they end up seizing from these kids? We're not talking about large amounts, are we? No, we're not talking about large amounts. Most of the time, small amounts of marijuana, um, something, <laughs> things that, you know, most police officers wouldn't deem as something that's a huge deal. But these young kids are getting caught into a situation that turns out to be a lot bigger than it should be. Mm. You know, it's it's just really troubling that we would go to so much time and effort and expense and, and to manipulate uh, young people like this uh, in order to just catch a couple dime bags, you know, maybe a quarter here and there, uh, just seems really ridiculous. And, and it, are, it, these kids, I mean, th- I, I, I keep saying kids, they're 18, right? Nobody involved in this was a minor. Is that correct? Um, at this point, um, from the information I got, the young man that I'm talking about, Justin, was 18 years old. Okay. But I would say that I could say that they're probably, you know, 16-year-old, you know, 17-year-old kids because this is a high school, and I doubt that they only targeted seniors. So I would say there are minors that are in there. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little creepy, you know. <laughs> we we hear all these uh, stories coming out of the high schools of the of the sex scandals, you know, the teachers that are, you know, seducing students, and, you know, they get run out of town on a rail. But here we've got cops that are basically kind of doing the same thing. They're sedu- they're not taking it all the way, obviously, but they're, they're seducing these kids and then, you know, t- for these sting operations. And what really frustrates me on this story, Cassandra, is uh, the, the, the young man you mentioned, not even a marijuana smoker, but as is so typical in America, he knows where to get marijuana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, Which it's, is true. We know that young people know where um, to get marijuana. There are some people that would say they know how to get marijuana, you know, 
that, that it's easier for them to get marijuana than it is for them to get alcohol or tobacco yeah, because yeah. of regulations around it. You know, this is... Um, Yo, go ahead. But to your point about um, young to, you know, the teachers and the sex scandals and how it's similar to, you know, the police officers, it's really about the manipulation. It's, in both cases, it's the manipulation of authority, um, mm-hmm. manipulating the feelings of younger people. And that's what's at the crux of this. So um, there's a strong it's manipulation mm-hmm. um, of, a, of a young 18-year-old. Yeah. Um, this is someone who thought he was courting someone um, who did not smoke marijuana, yeah. who it took him several days to come up with it and um, <laughs> didn't want to take the money. And because he thought he had a friendship with this person, um, who, who this person liked him. This was a 25-year-old woman. This was not an 18-year-old person. This was not someone who was in his age. This was an undercover police officer who set up this young man. Um who should not have been caught up in this in the first place. Absolutely crazy. We're speaking with Cassandra Frederick, a uh, policy associate with the Drug Policy Alliance. You can check them out at drugpolicy.org. And, you know, I'm reminded of uh, President Jimmy Carter when he spoke before Congress and he, he was introducing the idea of decriminalization of an ounce of marijuana at the federal level. And he had that famous quote where he said, the penalties for the possession and use of a drug should not be worse for the individual than the use of the drug itself. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase that and to say, the, the prosecution or the investigation of people using drugs should not be worse than drug use itself. And in this case, uh, I would say that the investigation and the flirtation and manipulation of this young man and others, other young people, is more harmful to them than the weed they might have smoked, the ones that did smoke. Right. And I would say that this is actually something that's very interesting because I'm based out of the um, the New York Policy Office at the Drug Policy Alliance. And right now we're running a campaign against the illegal marijuana arrests that are mm-hmm. happening in New York because the New York State Legislature said just that in 1977, that the harms associated with marijuana fail to compare to the harms associated with being involved with the criminal justice system. And that is why in New York, marijuana, 25 grams, under 25 grams has been decriminalized. So people can have up to under under 25 grams in their possessions, which is seven-eighths of an ounce, and that should be a $100 ticket. They should not be involved with the criminal justice system. It's a, non-arrest, it's, it's a non-criminal offense. However, because of the way that policing is done in New York and because of the criminalization of um, young people and um, certain neighborhoods, um, marijuana arrests are skyrocketing in New York. Last mm-hmm. year alone, the numbers just came in. There were over, there were near 51,000 marijuana arrests, which cost the city $75 million a year. 86% of those arrests are young black and Latino men. 70% are, the, are young people under the age of 30. Um, 50. Two percent are between the ages of 16 and 22. These are the same young people that are getting caught up in these sting operations in Florida. Like these are the same communities. Like, um, didn't they say that the drug war was supposed to protect kids? But how is arresting kids and criminalizing young people protecting them? Oh, Cassandra, what Um, about the children? What about the children? Won't you think of the children? Yeah, what about them? Exactly. We're not doing anything to save them. We're not doing anything to protect them. Uh, the money that they're using for these elaborate sting operations could be used as intervention programs for these same young people. Man. Instead, they're spending the money on arresting them and criminalizing them and really eroding their their, their the relationship between them and law enforcement. Absolutely. How can these young people trust our system if they're constantly being lied to and tricked? You're so right. Uh, Cassandra Frederick, uh, thank you for joining us here on Normal Show Live to tell us about this, you know, once again, disgusting assault on young people. I mean, just this week, we've uh, done a story on a strip search at a middle school looking for marijuana. We do so many stories of arrests and busts of young people. And I know when we've got good young people like yourself working on this issue that we are going to make these changes uh, for the better. Thanks for being here. And I hope we can have you back sometime. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, folks. When we come back, it'll be hour two. Toker Talk Radio hanging out with Ganja John. We got Cannabis Carry on the line as well. Uh, And that's it for hour one. Thanks for joining us for the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with more news and interviews you can use for the cannabis community. For Ganja John and Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers.
his normal show live. The voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs>